coming up on Colonial Crossfire. Kavanaugh's confirmation process faces a twist. A possible trade war with China escalates. And Paul Manafort agrees to cooperate with the special counsel. Joining us on the left, Dylan Bisescu. And on the right, Tom Crean. And I'm your moderator, Michael Schnell. From the GWTV studios in Washington, D.C., this is Colonial Crossfire. <laughs> New developments in Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation process, what was expected by many to be a smooth and speedy procedure, has turned into one marked by a sexual assault allegation and a possible second set of hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Will Kavanaugh be confirmed to the highest court in the land? Our student panel is here to discuss this and more. On the left, Dylan Basescu, a sophomore from Sleepy Hollow, New York, majoring in political science and physics. Dylan is a member of the GW College Democrats and sat on the campaign and debate, co debate committees last year. And on the right, Tom Crean, a junior from New York, majoring in philosophy and political science. Tom is currently the director of political affairs for the GW College Republicans. Thanks to you both for joining us. Back in July, President Trump nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court to fill Justice Kennedy's seat. What was anticipated by many to be an easy confirmation took an unexpected turn when a letter written by Kavanaugh's high school classmate, Christine Blasey Ford, was leaked. In the letter, Dr. Ford accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault at a high school party they both attended more than three decades ago. Now, with the Senate vote being pushed back and several senators coming out against Kavanaugh, the possibility of the judge being confirmed to the bench is in question. Tom, we'll start with you. Will Kavanaugh be confirmed? I think he will at the end of the day. Um, of course, Dr. Ford deserves to be heard, as do all uh, accusers and potential victims. Um, but at the end of the day, Kavanaugh is a smart jurist, and he has categorically denied it, um, something I don't think somebody who is guilty would have done, uh, given the legal repercussions of that. Dylan, your take? Um, there's a funny thing about categor categorical denials. Um, Bill Clinton, and I'll skewer my own party here, said, uh, I did not have relations with that woman. And at that point, that is a categorical denial, but it does not completely eliminate the possibility that something happened. Does Kavanaugh get confirmed? I don't know. But I think that it's a lot more in jeopardy. I think you have Susan Collins coming out against her. I th sorry, Susan Collins coming out against him. Potentially, I think that you potentially have Lisa Murkowski coming out against him. I think you have Jeff Flake saying that it's a non-starter if this doesn't get entirely cleared up. I think that there's a severe possibility for Brett Kavanaugh that he won't be confirmed, and I think we'll all be better off if he is. So I think the balance of evidence is certainly in um, Kavanaugh's favor currently, but obviously that's conditioned to change. And last year when I was on the show, I did denounce Roy Moore uh, as a predator and a bad person who didn't deserve to be in the Senate. And I hold that same principle and apply it to Kavanaugh, but I think we need to see what comes out. And I do think the Democrats in the Senate are being dishonest with the timing of this information, but not that that lessens the... Uh, uh, severity of the accusation, but it is worth noting. On the matter of the timing of this information, there was extensive evidence that uh, Ford did not want this to come out. She wanted to make a private statement to her senator. She thought Dianne Feinstein could should consider this in the balance of her vote on the matter. She said, I don't want this to come out. And there's a lot of reasons, I think we can see right now, that survivors of sexual assault and attempted rape do not want their stories to come out. And we should all be sympathetic to that. Dianne Feinstein ultimately had to come forward with this because there were leaks, because uh, information gets out. But ultimately, this was not intended to be a public process. This was supposed to be something that she submitted to her congressman, Anna Eshoo, and to Senator Dianne Feinstein. And the reason it leaked is uh, not necessarily known to us, but this was not supposed to be uh, you know, a strategic late in the game release. This was something that was supposed to be taken into consideration. And now we all have to consider it. So I let's let's just move on. Now let's say that K Kavanaugh is confirmed if, despite these allegations, the Senate does get enough votes and he goes forward to the court. Uh, a lot of senators and the public are concerned about the, the future of Roe v. Wade. So uh, Dylan, we'll start with you. What do you think, if Kavanaugh is confirmed, the future of Roe v. Wade looks like? I think that Roe v. Wade still exists, but that's a that's not a very meaningful statement because Roe v. Wade uh, 
uh, builds a lot of other precedent that comes after it, like Planned Parenthood v. Casey, like a number of cases that are being seen in the courts right now, uh, specific restrictions that were struck down, I believe, in Texas recently around uh, regulating the nature of abortion clinics and clinicians. And at that point, you can have Roe v. Wade, but if someone has to drive 100 or 200 miles to get an abortion, and they need a waiting period, and they need uh, potentially, uh, if they're in immigration custody, they need to be placed with a foster, as we saw in the recent case that Brett Kavanaugh ruled in the minority on, thankfully. I think that Roe v. Wade lives, but I think that it becomes so practically difficult to get an abortion, thankfully not in New York where I'm from, but in many parts of the country, that telling people that Roe v. Wade lives is like telling black people in the South that yes, you can vote because there's the 15th Amendment. It, it's not entirely practical if you don't have a body of law to support that nature. Tom, your take? Roe v. Wade certainly won't be uh, overturned. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, or Judge Kavanaugh has um, in the past expressed strong support for uh, judicial precedent. So I don't think that's a reasonable fear. Um, what will however probably happen is uh, different restrictions on abortion might come to be. And uh, that's something that the overwhelming majority of Americans support. Most people follow the, the Bill Clinton principle that the Democratic Party has seemed to abandon, that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Uh, now, we'll move on a little bit. The main difference between Anita Hill and Dr. Ford is that Dr. Ford's allegation comes in the wake of the Time's Up and hashtag MeToo movement. Despite these allegations, Trump has expressed his support for the judge. Here's Trump on Kavanaugh. I think he's an extraordinary man. I think he's a man of great intellect, as I've been telling you. And he has an unblemished record. Now, in the wake of these movements, how, if at all, will a failed appoint nomination of Kavanaugh affect Trump after he publicly pushed his support for him after these allegations came out? Tom, we'll start with you. I think it would definitely hurt Trump. Um, Obviously, the, if this nomination fails, then we uh, won't have time to put somebody up before the midterms. Uh, so that's definitely a concern. But in terms of possible other nominations, um, we have a, a very deep bench on the right. We have uh, Amy Coney Barrett. <clears throat> she was actually somebody I was supporting for this nomination. And I think she would make a great justice as well as Kavanaugh. So um, we, we have any number of people we can put up but a failed nomination would definitely be a political defeat for Trump. Uh, I don't think it would be a loss for the Supreme Court in the end, as we have many other options. Tom, your take? Uh, Dylan, your take. Sorry, I'm getting confused over here. That's all right. I think that the, the horse race politics is important, and I think he'll take a hit in the polls. I think that he's lost a lot of political capital on this nomination already, and it'll be a lot harder to push other things through, especially when the midterm's coming up and of course, senators don't want to do anything or say anything remotely controversial coming up on a midterm. But I think that what's more important is to focus on the impact that this has on the country, because Trump will still be the president after the midterms, and I, the Senate races are shaping up as they are. I don't think most people are laser focused on how senators are voting on Kavanaugh when it comes to this cycle of midterms. What I think is more important is how is this going to affect people? And I think that ultimately the impact on people is very positive. I think that not just on sexual assault allegations, but on friendliness to corporate interests, on voting rights, on civil rights, on abortion rights, I think that everyone in America, even the people that want Brett Kavanaugh to be confirmed, is meaningfully, functionally better off if he's not confirmed. And I think that is a denial of a massive swing to the right on the Supreme Court to stop him from being confirmed. So in 1991, Senators uh, Grassley and Senator Hatch insisted that the FBI launch an investigation into Anita Hill's accusations against Judge Thomas. Uh, they did, and it lasted three days. Now this time around, the two senators are saying, we don't need an investigation, let's head right to the vote. Do you think that there should be an investigation into uh, Dr. Ford's uh, accusations? Dylan, we'll go to you first. I think that there should be an investigation, and the reason I think there should be an investigation is because a lot of people have called this a he said, she said scenario, and right now, that's what it is. Right now, it's Brett Kavanaugh saying something and Christine Blasey Ford saying something. An investigation is the only way to clear that up, because when they take the stand, we know what Brett Kavanaugh is going to say. He's going to categorically deny it under oath, and we know that Christine Blasey Ford under oath 
is going to say, Brett Kavanaugh attempted to rape me. Or at least we have a strong belief that's what she's going to say. And one of them will have just committed perjury. So I think the only way that we can clear this up is to have an investigation so that senators can question them with a deeper knowledge of the nature of sexual assault, the psychology of the sexual assault, and uh, a firm understanding of the evidence as it stands when we've actually done an investigation. Tom, do you have a quick response? Yeah, so I do think that in principle there should be an investigation. It's tricky because it happened so long ago, so it's difficult to actually like look into the facts of the scenario. But I do think a good alternative or in addition to an investigation would be uh, as Senator Grassley invited uh, Dr. Ford to come speak either in a private or public session to the Judiciary Committee um, to, to set the record straight and I think that that's an opportunity that uh, she should take advantage of. Now we're running out of time but I'm going to throw one more question on the table. Judge Kavanaugh has said in past times that a president in office should not be subject to federal investigations. Do you agree with this statement? Tom, you first. I think it depends on the level of federal investigation. Obviously, if, if there's some charge, uh, some credible charge of high treason, then the president should be uh, subject to investigation. But if it's, if it's minor stuff, you can't bog down um, the country with bringing a sitting president under investigation. Dylan, a quick response? Uh, I don't know what my partner here is referring to as mild stuff, but right now the allegations that are beginning to be leveled against this administration are things to do with the collusion with the foreign power. They're things to do with violations of the Emoluments Clause, which is a fundamental anti-corruption provision in our Constitution. I think that to imply at all that this is minor stuff shows a historic decline in the Republican Party. In the 1970s, there were Republicans coming out after Bob Woodward released his story saying, Nixon's part of our party and Nixon still needs to be impeached. And I don't know where those Republicans went, but they're not here anymore. You have Republicans like Mr. Crane, you have Republicans in the Senate saying essentially he shouldn't be investigated and if he did, if he did do these things, so what? And I we're think gonna that's terrible. To, we're going to have to cut you off right there and end our segment. But after we return, we're going to go to Chinese tariffs and the possibility of a trade war in the future. Stay tuned. Do you want to just practice fake headlines, do our anchor voices? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. okay. On this week's episode of G Week, there is another election scandal. And former Vice Provost Peter Kay has been spotted back on campus rocking a brand new bandana. Boy, does he look sharp. And this year's Spring Fling performer is anticipated to be none other than the Cash Me Outside girl, Bahad Bahabi. Catch all this and more on G-Week. Yeah, this is stuff that would probably happen at GW. Yeah, I think so too. Now shifting gears to the topic of trade. On September 7th, President Trump threatened to place $200 billion worth of tariffs on Chinese imports, adding to the $50 billion worth of fees already in place beginning with a 10% tax and increasing to 25% by January 1st, 2019, this move would drastically increase the price of imported electronics and houseware in the U.S. And it will escalate the possibility of a trade war with China. In response to Trump's statement, China threatened to slap $60 billion worth of tariffs on U.S. goods, further escalating the looming trade war. Tom, in the past, increasing tariffs on foreign countries has not worked. Why do you think this time, if it is, is different? Well, I personally am a free trade Republican. Uh, I do think it's it's important to note that China is not playing on a level playing field, field with the United States. They have mass theft of intellectual property and other dishonest currency manipulative practices that, that make free trade with that country very difficult to begin with. Um, but either way, I don't think Republicans in Congress are going to pass a widespread and permanent tariff against China. I just don't think that's a reality. Dylan, what's your take? I think that if we're talking about China engaging in intellectual property theft, China engaging in dishonest currency manipulation, and I should add China engaging in labor practices that are abhorrent in the United States and in other countries around the world, you're right that we don't have a level playing field with China and there should be something done to level that playing field. But right now, what we're talking about are tariffs as a sanction, and this doesn't look like a sanction that's engineered to get the job done. It looks like a sanction, effectively, that's meant to lash out at China 
that's not calculated with a knowledge of what the response will be when China comes out and says, we're going to slap tariffs on $60 billion of goods, when Chinese companies become more hostile to engaging with the United States as the result of tariffs. I think that that's not good for anyone. I don't think it's good for US-China relations. And I don't think that it creates the possibility of an end game where we have free open trade with a China that doesn't possess an unfair advantage in the labor market or in the economic market. So if not tariffs, what do you think the uh, agreement could be? So what, what do you think the mode could be to bring China and the US to an agreement? And what will that mean for uh, our country going forward? So I think that, I think that China has uh, a lot of, I think that China has a lot of things to gain from engaging on a level playing field with the United States. I think that certainly there's there's diplomatic issues at hand when we're talking about China engaging with Japan, when we're talking about China engaging with South Korea, when we're talking about China engaging with the Philippines. These are all American allies where China stands a lot to gain in the diplomatic realm from engaging with the U.S. honestly and openly. I also think that uh, America has, when we talk about intellectual property theft, that's because uh, American uh, American innovations aren't being shared with China right now for good reason that China isn't acting as uh, an honest broker in this sort of dealing. But I think that in an honest dealing where we have free and open trade, there could be uh, innovative agreements between the United States and China. There could be scientific and cultural engagements between the United States and China. And I think that when Tom speaks of being a free trade Republican, I hope he's talking about a more cosmopolitan sense of trade and of the world where we have free trade, but we have a level playing field where workers in China and workers in the US are working for similar wages in similar working conditions, where there's some Chinese version of OSHA, for God's sakes, to make sure that uh, workers are safe and that you're not pinching pennies by killing people. Tom, care to respond? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's unrealistic to think that China will play fairly simply because we ask nicely. I do think we need to put some form of pressure on them, uh, be that a temporary tariff or some other type of diplomatic sanction. Um, it, the rise of China and their history of doing this um, in recent history just demonstrates that they won't stop if we simply ask them nicely. We do need to put some pressure on them. Now, uh, if these tariffs do go through and they are placed, is it a good move for the average American citizen, Tom? I mean, economically, obviously, prices on certain goods will go up, which is why I emphasize the temporary nature of any possible tariffs, because in principle, they are bad and they will hurt consumers. But um, we need to keep in mind the long-term damage that China undermining certain aspects of the U.S. economy causes. Um, and in the long term, though not immediately visible on a uh, price tag for electronics, it is, uh, it is a long-term effect that does economically damage Americans. Dylan? So I think that uh, it's a little bit contradictory to say that, you know, these are short-term tariffs, so they'll go away, and that's a short-term effect on the average American. <coughs> Excuse me but that they're gonna have some long-term effect on China. That's, uh, a, that's a little bit of a direct relationship that the more you wanna hurt China in this case, the more you have to hurt the US. It's playing chicken with our own economy and we're just hoping that China breaks first. And I think that it's not a smart idea to penalize with what is essentially a regressive tax the American consumer in order to try and hurt China if, as he says, this is gonna be temporary. Chinese companies will ride this out over a few quarters and then they'll go back to doing what they're doing and these tariffs will have ultimately failed at even the misguided end they were trying to achieve. So the trade relationship between the US and China is already on edge because of the trade deficit. Here's Trump on the situation. It is the largest deficit of any country in the history of our world. It's out of control. Dylan, how do you think these, uh, these tariffs will further affect U.S.'s relationship with China? I don't think that it's going to improve them at all, obviously. Uh, there's a famous quote that good fences make good neighbors, and I believe that's somewhat ironic in the way that it was said. And I think it's true that right now we're putting up a fence to China. Uh, we're not engaging in open dialogue with them. We're slapping conditions on them. And ultimately, when I spoke about sanctions earlier, the ultimate point of sanctions is to reach an end. They're not just to hurt people. They're to put pressure to engage in things in a different way where ultimately those sanctions are removed. And this isn't what these tariffs are looking like. These aren't, hey, we're doing this because we want you to change something. And the tariffs are only based on that. And they will be removed the moment that happens. A similar example was the Iran deal, where we put sanctions, they pressured action, and then sanctions were removed after that action was seen. 
And I think that that's not what's going on with China, so I think it hurts our relation with China greatly. I think that when we talk about Chinese developing uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea, when we talk about China uh, engaging in uh, what is essentially colonial economic practices with Africa, that's something where the U.S. is permanently shutting itself out of having any influence on China in those spheres I'm when it approaches China as an enemy. I'm going to cut you off there. Tom, care to respond? Yeah, well, I think what Dylan's talking about is important. And the way that we get China to stop these dishonest and unethical practices is by putting some fire on them. We can't, like, totally ignore this and just say, like, oh, we're going to ask them nicely to stop and be ethical. That has never worked in... in uh, human history with anyone so what we need to do is we need to apply some form of tangible pressure in the hopes that china sees this is what we can do and this is why they need to stop being an aggressor both economically and with unethical practices if i can speak specifically about the sorts of things that we would do i think that when we're talking about intellectual property theft when we're talking about uh, essentially chinese companies stealing american innovations and using them to their own ends to produce cheaper goods I think that what the U.S. government can do is partner with American entities to make sure that they're protected against that sort of theft. I think that first and foremost, if we want to be making investments somewhere that will actually help Americans, it's in increasing the amount of, uh, the amount of funding and the amount of help that we give to companies trying to prevent intellectual property theft. That itself will hurt China in that less intellectual property theft produces less economic growth for them. One, I have one more question. Uh, really quick, because we're running out of time, mm -hmm. how do you think these tariffs will affect the U.S.'s relationship with its other trade partners, other from China? I think other trade partners have nothing to fear because they understand the principle that if they play on an even playing field and play fairly, then the U.S. will respect that and trade openly and actively with them. And I think we've demonstrated that in the past. Dylan, quick response. I don't think that that's true. I think that we've seen the European Union is absolutely furious about this sort of thing. I think we've seen Trump go after the trade practices of the European Union, despite all indications to the contrary of his claims. And I think that it's scaring a lot of our partners around the world. It's scaring Canada. It's scaring, I, I would guess, Mexico. It's scaring nations within the European Union and Europe. And I think that it's damaging America's standing in the world overall. We're going to have to end things there. But after this break, it's rapid fire. Stay with us. So who do you think you're going to take in the first round this year? I don't know. I think I'm going to take Peyton Manning. He's still playing? I saw him in a commercial recently. I'm pretty sure he is. Oh, yeah. It's the nationwide yeah, commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, in the new studio? Come on. We don't, need, we don't have a football team. I guess no one told him it's all this football season. Yeah. Our panel joins us again now for Rapid Fire. Some quick answers to some quick questions. First off, the highly accredited Research One Milken Institute of Public Health here on GW's campus was commissioned by the Puerto Rican government to launch a study into the death toll following Hurricane Maria, which concluded that there were 2,975 casualties caused by the storm. Trump has since denounced the results, saying that the study was a political ploy by the Democrats to make him look bad. Do you believe this statement? Dylan, we'll start off with you. I think that that statement's ridiculous, and I think that I hope everyone here can agree that that is a ridiculous statement to make. And not only is it ridiculous, it's insulting. And to give you an idea of how insulting this is, we're all from New York. I, I think that we were all alive on the events of September 11th. 2,996 people died combined in New York and Virginia as the result of those attacks, and a, a few in Pennsylvania. This is almost as many people, within 1%, that's the same number. And I think that it's insulting to the Americans living in Puerto Rico, all 3.1 million of them, or I think 3.4, I'm not even sure. Over 3 million Americans living in Puerto Rico who are being denied their ability to grieve and their ability to know their loss because our president is lying about them. Tom, your thoughts? I agree with Dylan. I think the, uh, the president should definitely apologize for his remarks, and I think it's, it's a silly assertion to to claim the Democrats have anything to do with the milk and research. Cool. In a surprise move, former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort pleaded guilty to two federal charges and agreed to cooperate in a plea deal with special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. Tom, considering that Manafort had previously not agreed to help out with the investigation, 
Why is he cooperating now? And what does this mean for the entire Mueller probe? I think as with any sort of cooperation, it's usually in self-interest. He wants to minimize the, uh, the legal repercussions he will face. So uh, I think what it means wider on a wider scale is um, that we'll get to the bottom of this and see really who was implicated in this whole thing. Dylan, what are your thoughts? I think that it's a very good development. I think that people are cooperating with Robert Mueller. I think that's a good sign. I think that Trump is frankly scared at this point, and I think that he's doing what any petulant bully does when they're scared, which is to scream louder, to puff out their chest. And I think that when you see him standing on top of a sinking ship screaming that he's higher than anyone else, that's a very good sign. Now, uh, just recently, the Trump administration announced a plan to cap the number of refugees entering the country in 2019 at 30,000 individuals. This is the lowest cap a president has placed on the refugee program since it was created in 1980, and it's a decrease of 15,000 from the 45,000 person cap in 2018. Dylan, is this an effective way to protect the U.S.? No, and for everyone who thinks it is, uh, I think they're essentially saying that I shouldn't be here because on my father's side of my family, our family came from shtetls in Romania and Latvia because there were groups of Russian horse riders called Cossacks that burned down our villages and uh, made Jews flee the country. And we came to New York as a result. We came through Ellis Island. We came to Brooklyn. And I think that when you say that refugees shouldn't be here, I think that people should look back in their family histories and say, why did my family come here? Because I think that more than they realize, families are coming to America because it's the land of opportunity, because it offers safety. And I think that it's a little bit sick to deny, to come here and then close the gates and say, you know, go away, we've got ours. Tom, same question. My great-grandfather fled persecution uh, coming from Ireland to the United States. So I'm familiar with, with plights of many people across the world. However, the key word is uncontrolled. We can't have uncontrolled influx of refugees. We need to take them in, but only as we can handle, and they're much better suited in places closer to home or in Europe, uh, because it's much easier to acclimate to these places that are closer to home. And now for the million dollar question, the one that has been killing people all over and making them think and confusing them. Who wrote the New York Times op-ed? Tom, who's your prediction? Uh, I actually wrote the op-ed. <laughs> um, no, uh, my prediction is it's probably uh, some mid-level uh, White House staffer. I don't think it's, uh, it's Pence, as some people have been saying. Um, I think it's probably somebody we probably haven't heard the name of much, and they're, they're probably in the White House, but not like somebody who's on TV every day. Dylan, yeah. who's your pick? Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give a pick because I don't know but I think that that question is missing a more important issue which is that this is a completely dysfunctional White House and I think that if this was any other president if this wasn't someone who had so previously degraded our norms of uh, of government conduct this would be a headline leading story for weeks on end and I think that it's a little bit sad that this is what we've come to, that someone can come out and essentially say, I love all of the terrible things that the president is doing, but he seems a little iffy to me, so I'm going to block his administration. I think that that says something about the White House. That says something about the place that we're at right now. I don't think it's a good thing, and I think that when people read that op-ed, they should be focusing less on who wrote it and more about what it says about the absolutely insane nature of what's going on in the White House right now. And with that, we end our debate here on Colonial Crossfire. Tom Crean, Dylan Basescu, thanks so much for joining us today. When we come back, Callan Devery has our debate fact-checked. Stay tuned. What's up? If you like what you see, log on to gw-tv.com and all your dreams will come true, assuming your dreams are to watch more GW TV episodes. Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers monitored our debate. Callan Devery is here to fill us in on what we missed. Callan? Thanks, Michael. Our debaters got a couple of things wrong during our first debate of the season. Our conservative debater, Tom Crane, said that, the ask that asking individuals to be ethical has never made them ethical. This claim is statistically improbable and moreover cannot be definitively proven as it is such a broad statement and thus is disqualified as a fact. Crane also said that the timing of the Christine Ford allegations was dishonest. Timing as a concept cannot be dishonest. On the liberal side, Dylan Bisescu said that there should be a Chinese version of OSHA, implying that one does not already exist. In actuality, China already has an organization called the State Administration of Work Safety, 
which is responsible for the regulation of risks to occupational safety and health in China. Sescu also said sanctions are supposedly are supposed to be temporary and to reach an end. Sanctions are not necessarily temporary and can last for an undefined amount of time until action is taken to appeal them. Lastly, Dillon also stated the population of Puerto Rico was either 3.1 million or 3.4 million. While that was not far off from the truth, the population estimate is currently 3.34 million according to the United States Census Bureau. That's all from the fact check team. Back to you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks, Cal. And all right, well, that's all we have today for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. Be sure to check us out online at www.gw-tv.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Michael Schnell. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you back here next time.